It's been over half a decade, and Bloodborne can't ever seem to stop trending online. It's almost like clockwork, where someone either drops false leaks about there being a Bloodborne remaster, or there's a quick mention of Bloodborne from Sony or PlayStation themselves on their social media, or maybe there's like a Bloodborne cart, and like sharks smelling blood in the water, Fans arrive from all over, asking each other, asking themselves, asking Sony and PlayStation, whoever, for when Bloodborne is coming to PC. And that's a fair question to ask, because over the past several years, a growing list of PlayStation-exclusive titles, such as Death Stranding, Horizon Zero Dawn, The Last of Us, Returnal, have slowly but surely been ported to the PC platform. It does appear that Sony, as a business, finds PC porting to be a sound avenue for profit. Whereas in years prior, all of their Sony exclusive games would never dream of going multi-platform. So now the question becomes, when is it Bloodborne's turn? At this point, it's been seven going on eight years, and fans have asked for nearly everything under the sun with regard to it. A 60 FPS patch, a remaster, a full-blown remake, fans want something. They want more Bloodborne. However, before we can describe why Bloodborne deserves a proper reintroduction and what that ought to look like, we're gonna have to address the amygdala in the room. Bloodborne as a game has a lot of problems attached to it, clinging to each and every corner of its design. But if you don't know what you're looking at, you could say there were no issues at all. Understandably so. Bloodborne means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And I don't claim to know everything, nor have the answer for every one. This game has inspired so many game developers, writers, artists, and musicians. The cultural resonance that this game has had throughout the entire gaming industry cannot be understated. And yet, the deification of Bloodborne has also not done it any favors. And it starts with this. Now before I go any further, I need to qualify what I'm about to say. Unfortunately for you, I am a nerd who has put an obscene amount of time into playing the Soulsborne games, courtesy of From Software, Bloodborne especially. I've also gone to significant lengths to create essays and guides on Bloodborne itself in the hopes that other players, new and returning, become better informed and better understand how the game works. because. As something as I aim to prove today, Bloodborne needs a tremendous amount of help explaining itself. All of this combined with wide research and considerable input from a variety of different sources within the Bloodborne community, I feel enormously confident with my following thesis. Folks shouldn't be asking for a PC port of Bloodborne. They should be asking for a better Bloodborne first. As I will remind you, Bloodborne is a seven going on eight-year-old game. That's time long enough for rose-tinted glasses to start appearing on many people's faces. And at the same time, I've seen many people ask for what we could only conceive to be the bare minimum when asking for Bloodborne's theoretical return. As we move forward though, I want a lot of y'all to be patient with me here. Lean back a bit in your gaming chair. Try to hear all I have to say before you go jumping down into the comment section or on Twitter or on Reddit and start smash typing your piece. The time will come for that soon enough, I promise. For now, let's start with one basic idea. How do you re-release Bloodborne the right way? Folks want more Bloodborne, that's no secret, and the feeling is mutual. I want it too. First and foremost, Bloodborne on PC means that the game can be experienced by more people, because then it would be on a new platform. The question afterward ought to be this. What does that PC port look like? Because you had better hope that it's not something like the Dark Souls 1 PC port. Just in case you weren't aware, Dark Souls Prepare to Die Edition 
this was the full version of the game with the DLC attached, was perhaps the worst performing PC port that the Soulsborne series had. When Dark Souls 1 first came out in 2011, it would then later be ported to the PC a year after. And it was such a poorly optimized port that the community had to concoct their own mod to get the game to just run smoothly, aptly called DS Fix. This mod also gave Dark Souls basic PC-specific features like button remapping, allowing higher resolutions and frame rates, etc. It wasn't a perfect mod because the moment you got Dark Souls running at 60 FPS, there would be some issues with animations, sliding down ladders, disappearing into the ground. These problems were born from the fact that the game itself didn't have the proper dev time to see the PC port made well, let alone run at 60 FPS. This was revealed in an interview with one of the From Software producers at the time, stating that they did not, in fact, have the time. We're going to put a pin in this specific issue for the moment, though. We will come back to it. The Prepare to Die edition is a grim warning for what a Bloodborne fan might be anxious about in a bare minimum port. Because if Bloodborne came out on PC, obviously it ought to have 1080p 60fps, obviously it should have faster loading times, and let's not forget about the button remapping. Did y'all know or forget that the original Bloodborne doesn't have any button remapping at all? Fun fact, for those who aren't in the know, Jump shares the same button as Roll in Bloodborne. That's a fun little feature. You know what would make for some fun little features in a Bloodborne PC port? Adding more accessibility options. And I'm not talking about adding difficulty options. Difficulty options are but a small part of a larger accessibility discourse. I'm talking about options in settings that most of us take for granted. But the inclusion of said options would be absolutely crucial for some of the player base. For instance, being able to resize your HUD, which Dark Souls Remastered allows, by the way, or having colorblind options, and the ability to have high contrast text on screen, which the Demon Souls remake allows. Visual accessibility options like these benefit both players who have trouble seeing and players who might be playing across their living room on a big TV rather than up close with a monitor. If you get motion sickness easy, we ought to be able to turn off the motion blur that exists in Bloodborne. And while we're at it, can we turn off the chromatic abbreviation too? <laughs> to touch back on the topic of button remapping, besides getting rid of the inconvenience of jump overriding the roll, button remapping would be incredibly important for players who might only be able to play one-handed or with no hands at all. And all these changes are but a few accessibility options, because we could be here all day talking about audio, visual, and control-based changes that ought to be brought to Bloodborne so that anyone, no matter who they are, no matter what disability or personal hardship they face, is able to approach the game with the same excitement as the typical player does. And fortunately, the good news is that more and more recent studios have been adding said accessibility features to their games, both in AAA and indie titles. And Bloodborne, as important and praised of a game that it is, also deserves to be played by a broader audience. Because again, the point is this. If the true goal of Bloodborne being on PC or being re-released to PS5 is to make it more available to more people, then make it so. Accessibility aside, here's another question for y'all. How much do you think Sony might want to charge you for the privilege of playing Bloodborne again? Even if it's on PC, PS5, what have you. $40? 60? How about the oh so coveted $70 price tag? If you are someone who says that a price tag doesn't matter, you will buy Bloodborne for PC, I want to ask you to consider the principle of the matter. If the PC port was, for all intents and purposes, terrible, effectively, what Sony is giving you is Bloodborne with a slip of paper on it that reads, hey, this game is busted, but it might be fun to fix, though. And I have to add 
a special mention to non-US players here. Folks in various countries who have varying currency exchanges, South America, Oceania, Europe, hip, shout outs to Canada, and so on. The price to pay for new games, let alone Bloodborne on PC, will most likely be exceedingly high. And now imagine telling those same players that they're getting an incomplete product too, and that they have to mod it in order for it to be good. And again, at the very least, one plus of Bloodborne being available on PC, no matter the price, would undoubtedly be the fact that it could be modded. It's almost like a safety net for games being on the PC platform. If certain modders are strong-willed enough, they will find a way to make Bloodborne on PC operational, even if Sony can't do it themselves. And while the most loyal of fans might weather the storm, I'm not convinced that a large majority of newer players won't in fact get lost through the holes of that metaphorical safety net. It largely depends on how Sony accepts modding of Bloodborne, if they acknowledge it at all. They're not Bethesda. Sure, insert your Todd Hauer memes here, but one thing Bethesda readily does, you know, especially with a game like Skyrim, is promote modding. It's right there in the main menu of the game too. Bethesda encourages the presence and development of modding in their community. So to see either Sony or From Software allow such an open range of modification with their titles would be a sight to see, but all the more unlikely. Which is why the following sentiment is so, so important. If Bloodborne is coming to PC, they have to get it right the first time, have to. Or even if they don't, they ought to continue aiding Bloodborne's presence on PC with continued developer support. That's a big word. While we're on this idea of support, let's get more recent with our examples and talk about Elden Ring on PC. When Elden Ring came out back in February of 2022, it had tremendous amounts of performance issues on several PC rigs. The multiplayer would constantly disconnect people. And perhaps the biggest kicker, something that was supposed to help the game? Easy anti-cheat. In what seemed like a cruel joke, Easy anti-cheat, which came packaged with Elden Ring, would disconnect sessions between players while in the middle of co-op or invasions, even if the players in question were playing without cheating. Now, most of those performance and connection issues that I've mentioned seem to have been fixed in the most recent patches going through December. However, it took 10 months for the PC port of Elden Ring to make this progress. Adding further insult to injury, in spite of Easy Anti-Cheat's presence, there is still cheating on PC Elden Ring. It might not be as prevalent as cheating would be in earlier titles, but just as some modders find the will to make a game better, some nerds find a way to do the exact opposite. Would we expect something similar with Bloodborne? And I'm not talking about the cheaters, I'm talking about easy anti-cheat. Imagine Bloodborne's multiplayer with EAC. And now I bet some of y'all forgot that Bloodborne has multiplayer. Just as a refresher, Bloodborne has co-op, invasions, and sharing Chalice Dungeon codes as its multiplayer. Where do you think the funny Chalice came from? Would a PC port improve these features or only weigh them down? Or would a PC port have it at all? If Bloodborne came to PC, would it be so lucky to have a couple of months of developer support after its release, let alone the 10 months that Elden Ring has so far? Is that even on the table for Sony and whoever they get to make the port? Is it worth it for them to even care? Now, hold on. I apologize. A lot of rhetorical questions. There is a clear answer here, and I want to walk it through with y'all. Keep two words in the back of your head as we move deeper into this topic. Support and preservation. Support for a game often comes in the form of bug tickets, updates, refunds, and above all, consistent developer and player communication. Then there's preservation. We live in a time when online servers are being shut down for many different games out there. Many different games that are supposedly online only are now being lost forever. We live in a time when older consoles are getting harder to come by and proper copies of original video game releases are distinctly expensive. 
We also live in a time when a concerning amount of game developers and publishers have not been actively preserving and future-proofing their gaming catalogs. Support and preservation. Two things which, unfortunately for us, were absent when it came to Dark Souls 1. Despite the Prepare to Die edition being such a poor PC port, it would never be officially patched to address its many performance issues. Not until in 2018, when publisher Bandai Namco got a third-party developer, two actually, to develop a remastered version of Dark Souls 1. When this remaster came out, the original Prepare to Die edition would be delisted on several online storefronts, most prominently Steam. You can now only buy the remaster there. The final nail in the coffin came just last year, in 2022, when the original Prepare to Die edition would have its online matchmaking servers permanently shut down. Many nerds joke about how certain games are dead when they have low player counts on Steam or low viewership on Twitch. Well, here's a game that was dubbed the ultimate video game of all time, and you can't buy it. Not easily, anyway. Is this what will happen to Bloodborne if it gets a remaster or a remake? where the original gets left behind only to be seen on a few collector's shelves or deep in the bowels of local game stores? In the pursuit of facelifting a game to modern standards, what gets lost in the process? Sorry, more rhetorical questions. This is actually an excellent segue though, to talk about both Dark Souls Remastered and the Demon Souls Remake, and what these two projects might mean when it's Bloodborne's turn. Contrary to popular belief, both of these re-releases created a large division in the Souls community over their very existence. First, let's start with the Dark Souls remaster. On a technical level, the remaster is hands down the better optimized game compared to the original. On the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, Dark Souls 1 ran terribly in several different areas of its own game, notably Blight Town, New Londo, and any areas with fire-breathing dragons, and there are many. Now, the remaster on Xbox One and PS4 has basically a locked 1080p 60fps everywhere in its world. And what's more, the remaster brought Dark Souls to the Nintendo Switch, an entirely new platform. This Switch port, by the way, runs exceptionally well for being on a console that also operates as a handheld. If you were to compare Dark Souls' performance on the Switch to, say, the most recent Pokemon game, the difference is as clear as day. Hats off to the Switch port developers. Y'all did an amazing job. What this also goes to show is that the original Dark Souls was not a well-optimized title. Heck, most of From Software's history is riddled with similar performance issues in their games, regardless of the platform. This will also be a keynote to remember for later in the video as well. However, the platform that can't say that they saw any significant improvements was PC. Compared to the DS fix that PC players already had for years, all of these supposed performance increases now stuck behind a decently sized price tag was an incredibly tough sell. What further divided fans was the fact that the remaster would add a mixed bag of changes to the overall game. Some were visual, like changing the lighting and retweaking the appearance of bonfires, and some were practical, like adding a new bonfire by Vamos and increasing the amount of players in one multiplayer session. For some fans, the remaster didn't do enough. The remaster may have offered some quality of life improvements, sure, but the game still held plenty of glitches, exploits, and dated mechanical problems that didn't get any attention. And for others, the remaster already did far too much with what they did change. Regardless of which camp you might subscribe to, if we were to grade the remaster purely on its technical performance compared to the original, and, for the sake of argument, we agreed that the PC port of the remaster was not a success. It would still be a solid purchase for three out of the four available current-gen platforms. One of those platforms, by the way, didn't even have Dark Souls in any capacity prior to 2018. You can also take that platform on the go anywhere. Three out of four is a 75%, and in most grading scales, that's still a passing grade, 
A decent grade, actually. How's the saying go? C's get degrees. But is this what Bloodborne deserves? That's not a rhetorical question. Before we answer it, let's quickly talk about the Demon Souls remake. The same division that was present with the remaster becomes amplified when it comes to the remake. Firstly, let's state without a doubt that the remake is an incredibly optimized version of Demon Souls, with performance so smooth, graphics so clear, animation so carefully crafted, loading time so fast, it amazes, without a doubt. And yet, despite the game looking like a 2020 video game, it still played like a 2009 video game. This is what caused the remake to be received to such mixed responses. Now, the developers behind the remake, Bluepoint, intentionally made it a point to leave a fair majority of the original game's gameplay intact. By contrast, there was a sizably strong pulse in the community that wondered if Bluepoint could have done more with this remake opportunity that they had. Could they have improved and gotten more in depth with the boss move sets, the world tendency mechanics, and have fully touched up the online functionality? At this point, we'll never know. But you see, the remake's gameplay isn't exactly one-to-one -one with the original Demon Souls. A majority of the remake's changes were smaller quality of life improvements, and they were quite welcome additions. But there were a few oversights that were and still are critically detrimental to the remake's playing experience. A few examples are online oriented. For instance, there's an issue when players, particularly Black Phantoms, get stuck behind enemy mobs while in multiplayer, and they can't move around the mobs. They can't move them, they can't hit them out of the way. Once a mob is in front of a Phantom's way of getting through the level, there's no getting around them. The original game, however, allowed those same Phantoms to hit those mobs out of the way. Another issue, Bluepoint puzzingly remove the ability to receive souls from defeating other players in multiplayer. Souls are not only needed to level up your character, but also to restock on used consumables or to repair equipment that have lost their durability. However, as the remake is now, hosts and phantoms defeating invaders don't receive souls, and invaders don't get souls when they used to be phantoms. So what used to be a real and tangible reward for winning a multiplayer interaction has effectively been nullified in the remake. Meanwhile, being able to quit out of multiplayer was something that Bluepoint made way too convenient. During the remake's time in the sun after its release, there were so many fast and frequent willing disconnects because quitting during a multiplayer session was given a bright white option in the pause menu, whereas in every other Soulsborne game, including the original Demon Souls, this option would have been grayed out. In the original game, the player has to vacate a multiplayer session by the means that the game provides them, by using items like the separating stone, or they would have to win the multiplayer interaction, or they would have to die. Instead, what players can expect in the remakes online are constant disconnections, which negatively impact the co-op and invasion experiences far too often. And as one final example, there were exploits not present in the original Demon Souls, but were present in the remake. Like how a player could have negative luck. Yeah, negative luck. Worse, having this negative luck means that a player could one-shot anything and anyone. Players, mobs, bosses, you name it. The biggest gut punch to this was that Bluepoint attempted to address these issues in a few couple of patches right after the remake's release, but they were never fully fixed. Bluepoint would only create a handful of updates for the remake before going completely silent after December 2020. For two whole years, there has been no more patch support from Bluepoint, and we have not heard back from them since. Now. I'll relinquish that most folks playing Demon Souls might not even run into the issues I talked about, especially if they play offline. But here's the thing, the online of Soulsborne games is closely knitted to the unique experience that they offer, Demon Souls especially. And the fact that the online environment was left in such disarray with minimal support is disheartening to say the least. 
Speaking of the experience of Demon Souls, the experience of the remake was already heavily critiqued by many fans, most of whom did not agree with the remake's artistic divergence from the original. Graphically, the depth and details of the remake is next-gen worthy. The sounds, the sights, the feel, those are, without question, the remake's biggest strengths. But it's those same artistic liberties that Bluepoint took in creating the remake that also generated apprehension. When they first revealed the remake, designs and themes that were once iconic and emblematic of the original Demon Souls were shown to be redesigned and remixed. Most said designs in the remake were effectively made with a different artistic direction. Viewing some examples side by side, you can see and hear the differences. But I'm not here to tell you which is the superior vision, because that's not what's important here. Remember the word preservation. Preserving the original designs, the original atmosphere, the original songs of the PlayStation 3 Demon Souls is a worthwhile endeavor, because there is a lot we can learn from that original game in its base form. We can witness how the From Software developers made their first title, the constraints they had to work under, the unfamiliarity that they might have had with the experimental systems that they created, and ultimately, we would see the foundations of what would become greater heights than anyone at the time assumed these devs were even capable of. And yet we can't play that original version. Not easily, anyway. Not without hunting down a PS3 and finding a physical copy, or getting an emulator that decently cooperates with our PC, right? We can only buy the remake on the PlayStation storefront, once we get a PS5 first, that is. Now, the remake is beautiful in many, many ways. And yet, in almost every way that it is beautiful, it's because of what came before. Before I go any further, I want to make it clear this isn't a supposed hit piece on the developers of the remake. Listening to the many different interviews of Blue Point's leads and staff for the Demon Souls remake, I am actually convinced that the folks working on the project genuinely loved and cared about Demon Souls. They wanted to do it justice and seemed to want to support it for as long as they were able. And believe me, I do not take for granted the gargantuan task it would have been to have shouldered all the potential expectations and prickly scrutiny from fans while also having to modernize what seemed to be an untouchable classic. I personally applaud them and what they were able to accomplish. The same goes to Q-Lock with the Demon's Souls remaster. Truly, thank y'all. But this feeling of gratitude is bittersweet. I'm not sure if we will ever find out why the updates for the remake stopped as abruptly as they did, or if the remake will ever get support again. Furthermore, I'm not sure if the original Demon's Souls will ever be publicly accessible online anytime soon, nor the original Prepare to Die edition of Dark Souls for that matter. As of writing this, the only way to play the original Demon Souls through legitimate means online would be to acquire a PS Now license from the Japanese PlayStation Store. Yeah. This is why asking for a remake or a remaster of Bloodborne puts things in such a precarious situation. We don't know what Sony or a third-party developer would do with the refurbished product, not to mention the original. Maybe Bloodborne on PC might just be that, a decently done port. Could have been worse, but also could have been better. Drop 40 or 60 bucks and go about your business. Or could they do something a bit more drastic, and we might end up losing something important in the process? The opportunity and the risk go hand in hand, and there is a lot of risk riding on Bloodborne. If there existed a perfect compromise, we would have to look at an example, the Halo 2 anniversary. Regardless of how y'all might feel about the anniversary's updated graphics, you, the player, still have the option to go back and forth between newer and original versions of those Halo games. If Bloodborne had to get its graphics, art, music, animations remixed in any conceivable manner, then this swap feature ought to be one of the highest priorities if it was possible. No, not, not only if it was possible, just find a way for preservation. That is what Bloodborne deserves. And 
I think I speak on behalf of all Bloodborne nerds everywhere when I say that what needs to be preserved is also what folks remember most fondly about Bloodborne, and that's the aesthetics, the setting, the music, and perhaps most importantly, its action. Bloodborne's gameplay is one that is centered around momentum, being agile, adaptable, learning how to dodge and weave between the relentless nature of typically large and looming foes. There is a harmony in the game where your own mistakes can brutally take you down, but simultaneously, there is an immense satisfaction when you feel like you've mastered the challenge. Prey slaughtered, it's in the words. And on top of it all, Bloodborne's crowning jewel is in the arsenal of trick weapons you can find in the game. Something that has yet to be replicated, not only by other game devs, but by From Software themselves. Just pick a weapon and you've got something that ranges from marginally cool to this weapon is too cool, can we nerf the cool factor on this one actually and save some for the rest of them? The dashes, the slashes, the impact of smashing the bones of your enemies, or straight up tearing them apart after hitting them with a parry is the core of what makes Bloodborne fun. And what's more, Bloodborne's combat is complemented by the enemies you have to fight. It's a, not a controversial statement to say that Bloodborne is home to some of From Software's most engaging and compelling bosses to fight. Not all of them, but when Bloodborne reaches a high, that note is extraordinarily high. So combine the challenge with the combat, the atmosphere, the orchestral music, and you get near perfection in gaming. And I think it's these highlights that many players lovingly call back to, even years after the fact. It's what many will remember years from now. And it's why most might rank Bloodborne so generously when comparing it to the other From Software titles of recent memory. And believe me, I'm right there with them. When Bloodborne slaps, it leaves you with a red mark and has you begging for more. So why did earlier in my video, did I suggest that folks ought to be asking for a better Bloodborne, let alone a PC port? This right here is why what I have to say next is not said lightly, but with a tremendous amount of respect and tender care. Bloodborne is one of a kind, but it's no masterpiece. And let me be clear, Bloodborne is an incredible action game with an immaculate atmosphere and a first time experience that you can't find anywhere else. But it is also a poorly fleshed out RPG with horrible performance, even worse multiplayer support, and a distinct lack of polish surrounding its gameplay loop. This is not to imply that Bloodborne is a broken game, no, 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 no. That would imply that Bloodborne was a complete game in the first place. You see, Bloodborne is a game filled with raw potential, raw in both senses of the word. It is incredibly bold and expressive while also needing way more time in the oven. For instance, you've already probably heard about Bloodborne's long loading times and poor frame rate performance, but at its release, it was so, so much worse. Despite being a game made solely for the PlayStation 4, it was anything but optimized for the platform. But before we go any further, let's bring up that topic again about From Software devs releasing games in a rush. Typically, when you see a game that's buggy and haphazardly thrown together when it comes to the release date, it's almost always a tale of tragedy rather than one of malevolence or incompetence. If there is anything y'all should learn from this video, Know that most game developers in the industry today, and especially back when Bloodborne was being made, are vastly overworked and underpaid. Those same game devs are also placed under immense stress and long work days to reach unsustainable deadlines. Did you know that Bloodborne was delayed by one month in 2015? That one singular month was woefully not enough, and all that extra month most likely resulted in was simply more excessive overtime and several rushed or straight up cut features and mechanics. For those who aren't aware, worker crunch is rampant in the gaming industry, and From Software is no different. I can sit here and talk your ear off about how Bloodborne or Sekiro or Dark Souls or Elden Ring is their best project ever, but that means nothing if their developers 
the ones on the work floor making the game aren't treated humanely. Now, this isn't implying that you, the viewer, are in some way immoral because you bought a product built from unfair working conditions. The blame is laid squarely at the feet of those who manage the scheduling and deadlines at the studios. Typically, it's the higher or middle management positions making such decisions that will cost dearly for hundreds of programmers, artists, engineers, animators, modelers, and so on. The first best thing that you, the players, can do is just to be aware that crunch exists. Do some research too, don't just take my word for it. Then consider supporting a local game dev, be them indie or AAA. Give them your ear, listen to their stories and experiences. Help them by backing developer-run unions who are trying to get them better wages and hours. And you know, treat game developers like they're human beings. Their names appear in the credits for a reason. Game development is a combination of math, software engineering, and creative artistry. It's not easy, especially if you want to make something that people are going to remember for years to come. And yet, looking at some of the discourse these days, it comes across as if game development is an entirely thankless profession. Like when a title finally reaches shelves and online storefronts, way too often does ridicule and blame get thrown around to workers who don't even deserve it. These workers will have their integrity questioned by anyone who could breathe and thinks they know how all video games are made. It's disappointing at best and utterly revolting at worst to see how the typical dev is treated when they're not an icon like Kojima or Toby Fox or even Miyazaki himself. The fact that devs still want to make games in today's era is something we should all be grateful for. And as we look at Bloodborne, there is a lot to be grateful for. But now, for this next part, this might be a rude awakening for some fans out there. Do understand, as we start to look at the faults of Bloodborne, it's with a lens that is critical, but not cruel. Because like I said, the more you play Bloodborne, the deeper you go, you start to witness what the true cost Worker Crunch did to this game's longevity. Consider the following to be a tough love letter from me to the game that we, not just I, feel enormously passionate about. I'm going to highlight what I believe to be the biggest problems that plague Bloodborne to this day, and will most likely continue to plague it even if it got ported to PC without some massive overhauls and improvements. To set the stage, let's talk about what we're going to call the bare minimum. We've already spoken about it in greater detail earlier, but one more time for the people in the back, two bare minimum of improvements, especially if it's coming to PC, accessibility options, and performance upgrades. As for accessibility, include them. Some of them, any of them, please. Button remapping, please, at the very least, come on, just don't have the jump on roll anymore. When it comes to performance, some of y'all are probably already aware of the unofficial 60 FPS patch made by a modder by the name of Lance McDonald. It was largely thanks to this 60 FPS mod that the broader Souls community became completely convinced that Bloodborne can get running at higher performance. This is the spark that has led many a nerd to demand an official 60 FPS patch for Bloodborne whenever it's seen trending online. And Yet, if I had to be the bearer of half bad news, the 60 FPS patch isn't perfect. Much like DS Fix before it, even Lance acknowledges it. The patch is just that, a proof of concept. Lance has stated online that getting a game to run at 60 FPS only requires a few lines of code to be changed, which sounds simple, but remember, game development rarely ever is. As it turns out, there are small but noticeably numerous issues that crop up once Bloodborne starts running at 60 FPS. Most of the new issues are relatively minor, some completely negligible. Perhaps the biggest pothole, though, would be the fact that 60 FPS changes the length of your character's rolls and dashes, and makes them smaller. Changing the reliability of a dodge that's supposed to save you from danger, a move that most players will use quite often, has the potential to be a crippling problem for anyone's playthrough. Rolls keep the momentum fast, forward, borderline frantic, but always fully engaging. So let's say that Bloodborne on PC allows 60 FPS and online multiplayer. I can only imagine that shortened rolls would not be a welcome sight in co-op and invasions. Another point, while Lance's patch 
proves 60 FPS can be done, it also proves that more needs to be done. More lines of code need to be tweaked and polished in order for the 60 FPS experience to be as seamless as it can be, like with more games recently in the From Software lineup. Regardless, everyone think this nerd, by the way, he did us a service. Thank you, thank you. So now with this bare minimum as the foundation, there would still be a lot to cover if we were to go over every single bug, law, or oversight that Bloodborne has within its design. I'm instead going to hyper-focus on three of the biggest prevailing issues, problems that also might be inseparable from Bloodborne's design. And the first is multiplayer. Now, for folks out there who don't care for multiplayer in the Soulsborne games, hear me out. Having the multiplayer for Bloodborne PC is still important because some of the unique interactions that can arise from online besides co-op or team fights in PvP are the unique multiplayer features found in sharing chalice dungeons. It's from sharing glyph codes that we got access to unseen content, both new enemies, new bosses, new areas, and cut content even. Shoutouts to Zuli the Witch and the Tomb Prospectors. Bloodborne's multiplayer is most certainly half-baked, but it was onto something really special. I would hope more folks would get to try it out in the future, but I would also want that first time experience to be way more smoothed out than how it is now, currently. The functionality of Bloodborne's online is perhaps the worst the Soulsborne series has to offer, and that's saying something. And it all stems from four special qualities, I guess you could call it. The first, matchmaking, or finding other cooperators and adversaries. The matchmaking is entirely too restrictive. Souls games typically have you place down summon signs on the ground for other players to pick up if they pass it by. More recently, in Elden Ring, From Software patched in a global matchmaking feature that can search for co-op and invasions from practically anywhere. Meanwhile, Bloodborne demands that you have to be in the same undefined vicinity as the player you're trying to co-op or invade with. What's more, this connection area is immensely limited. Walking down some stairs could be enough to prevent the matchmaking from pairing two players with each other, even if those same two players are compatible to join one another and are actively searching. In retrospect, it appears that the intent of Bloodborne's bell system was to no longer require having to walk up and pick up other player summon signs. You could, theoretically, connect with cooperators or adversaries while on the move. But how can this be possible if the bell matchmaking system is so limited by design? If Bloodborne were to be updated to how Elden Ring has near and far connections, or even how Bloodborne has its short route connections where you can passively search for co-op or invasions with one simple button, that would be a step in the right direction for the game. A second quality. You can't choose who you're connecting with. The summon signs of other Souls games show you who's available to pick up, what their names are, and even what their builds might look like. But with Bloodborne, the moment you connect with someone, you summon them, no questions asked. There is no extra consideration on the part of the host. There's also no way for duelists to summon one another for secluded 1v1s or for team fights. These same players have to subject themselves to Bloodborne's forced, inconsistent, and limited matchmaking, while also having to deal with 30% less health. The solution, besides just doing away with the bell system entirely in favor of the already tried and true summon sign system, which apparently the alpha version of Bloodborne had at one point in time, the solution would be for Bloodborne to allow hosts to choose who they're summoning. Maybe there ought to be a submenu that can appear that tells you whose bell resonance you've connected to before you can invite them into your world. In the same way that there's a menu where you can decide who to silence the blank out of your world, there should be a menu that decides who you can bring into your world. Also, there should be a way to summon duelist adversaries into your world for PvP. And when you summon those duelists, by the way, through the personal summon system, make it so that they don't lose 30% of their health like invaders would typically get. This is the standard for nearly every other Souls game. Bloodborne should be updated to the standard. 
the third quality, the delayed netcode. This one's a bit tricky to explain because I don't want to throw a lot of internet software jargon at you. The best way for you to understand is to show you that Bloodborne's hit registration is slow. On a decent connection, here's an example of a hit going through an Elden Ring. And now, here's how long a hit takes to register in Bloodborne. Did you catch it? On average, it takes three times as many frames for Bloodborne's netcode to register hits between players. And that's with players who are on LAN connections and who are in the same region as one another. Even Dark Souls 2 does a better job at hit registration. Don't believe me? There's a video comparing Bloodborne and Dark Souls 2 made by Scott Jun. Shoutouts, y'all can view that material as well. Bloodborne's netcode needs to operate on the same level that most current Souls games already do, if not better. Fourth quality, the lack of weapon level matchmaking, or rather, a blood gem matchmaking. One of the banes of playing the older Soulsborne games is that there is a vast imbalance of attack power in co-op and invasions. Some new players can inadvertently summon a cooperator who can walk up to a boss and defeat them in a few hits, completely overriding any of the challenge and potential fun that's there. At the same time, an invader can show up and completely one-shot a host and their friends, who might not even be packing such heat to retaliate. Basically, through over-leveling, over-upgrading your gear, certain engagements become trivialized to one or two hit affairs. A mechanic that was included in Dark Souls 3 in an Elden Ring, which attempted to smooth over these extremes, was something called weapon level matchmaking. In short, players would only be able to connect to other players who had similarly upgraded gear. If you have fully upgraded weapons, for instance, you would only be able to play with other fully upgraded cooperators and other fully upgraded invaders. You would not be able to interact with players who haven't upgraded anything at all. Now, this system isn't perfect in Elden Ring or Dark Souls 3, because password summons exist, but this would definitely help Bloodborne. It's a step in the right direction. But in fact, we would have to go a step further and tailor this matchmaking to Bloodborne's blood gems. Now let me explain really quickly. There are three steps to get your weapons to do damage in Bloodborne. The first two being upgrade your weapons with bloodstone materials, and the second is level up your stats that scale with the said weapon. The third, perhaps the most crucial piece, is to equip blood gems that also raise the attack power of the said weapon. In fact, it would be fair to say that blood gems do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to dealing damage in Bloodborne. We'll go over how imbalanced the gem system can really be, but for the moment, know that multiplayer is most definitely affected by them. Thus, if a weapon level matchmaking system was introduced in Bloodborne, it should also be affected by which blood gems are slotted in a player's weapon. Perhaps a good direction to get started in would be for the matchmaking to pay attention to the rating of the blood gems you've acquired. If you've gotten a high rating blood gem, you should only connect with other folks who have also acquired similarly rare gems. If this isn't a fine science, there, there should be a range to all of this, but like I've said, would be a good starting point for a re-release. Afterwards, if you still get one shot, it's probably because you didn't level vitality, but who does that anyway? Wrapping up the multiplayer talk, there are still a few more issues with it that would need extra consideration, and I'm gonna rapid fire through some honorable mentions. The player count of five players should be increased to six. This would match with the more modern Souls games. The Belrine women ought to be able to respawn even after they have already been killed, as if they're on a timer. A little bit further on this point, in the Souls games, there are something called invasion timers. If you've already been invaded once, then you shouldn't be invaded for X amount of time, depending on the game, before another invader can come into your world. For bell ringing women, there should be a respawn timers of their own if your co-op group went to found the bell ringer, killed her, but then have still lingered in a world for a little while longer. She should come back. 
Also, those bell ringing women should have more varied respawn locations so that they aren't so easily found and killed. This one's more of a general fix, but restocking your vials, bullets, and consumables should not require a trip back to the hunter's dream. Bloodborne lamps themselves just need an overhaul. They ought to operate more like the bonfires from the Souls games, where you can restock and repair your equipment with ease, and furthermore, allow us to use the lamps to just fast travel to any other lamp. We shouldn't just have to go back to the Hunter's Dream just to go back to another place in the same area that we're in. Also, one more thing. If Bloodborne were to come to PC, and it were to retain its multiplayer, what are the odds that Bloodborne will get cross-play or cross-progression? Because let me tell you right now, if there is none of that, instantly, so many player-created characters and player-created chalice dungeons will be entirely separated and nullified between platforms. If the RPG mechanics of Bloodborne remain as they are, the community would have to rediscover all of the best blood gems, kale runes, and different weapon types, and totally new dungeon glyphs. Would the passion and fervor that found these items so long ago in the past be there again to find them? This is also not considering that players on PC don't just try to cheat engine their way to get better equipment. That is, of course, if easy anti-cheat will allow you to even try to do that. But one last thing I'll talk about. Remember when we talked about support? Bloodborne received updates for 10 months after its release on PS4. Afterwards, From Software had to move on to later titles. Now, imagine if Bloodborne on PC, again, isn't released in a proper state. Would there be any support after the fact? Keep that in mind. Moving on to the second anchor, keeping Bloodborne below water, the Chalice Dungeons. On paper, they're a spectacular idea. New environments, new gear, new enemies and bosses that players might have never seen before, but they would all be placed in random order, so the exploration aspect of the game would still be made fresh and entertaining. In practice, however, before you can even get the randomly generated chalice dungeons, you had to go through all of the mandatory fixed chalices. And those fixed chalices need a lot of fat trimming. The first two chalices, the Thumaru and the Central Thumaru, have unique bosses in each layer, save for the Beast Possessed Soul. The chalices after those two only have repeats and slight variants of previously seen enemies all the way until you reach the Great Thumaru Ill. The Great Ill, by the way, is five chalices after the central Thumaru. To further cement the point that the fixed chalices are a bloated middleman between the player and the randomly generated root chalices, look no further than Abritus and the Great Is Chalice. In the base game, when you confront and beat the Daughter of the Cosmos, you get the Great Is Chalice as a reward. Then, once you dive into that chalice, you get to fight a jumped up bumpkin in the form of a brain sucker, the celestial emissary, but without any of his friends, and a Breedus all over again. Only then, once you've beaten all three of them, can you have your randomly generated is chalices. Now, From Software might never have revisited the Chalice Dungeon idea one-to-one -one after Bloodborne, but if they were to, I think they're poised to make the RNG Chalice idea really stick. I'm not counting the caves, catacombs, tunnels, and hero graves of Elden Ring in this assessment, because those are handcrafted. I'm speaking about the randomly generated nature of the Chalice Dungeons. If they were to return to the idea, or if Sony were to return to Bloodborne, at the very least make Chalice bosses more unique. Perhaps give the bosses more varied movesets if there have to be repeats. Like if Amelia was in a Chalice Dungeon. She's not, but if she was, her Chalice boss should have a distinct difference from her story boss fight. There could be new moves, new appearance. There, maybe throw in a little gremlin side enemy into the arena for a haha, -ha, we heard you didn't like Godskin Duo and we thought that was hilarious kind of moment. But honestly, revamping repeat bosses is something that From Software is already capable of doing. One of the chalice bosses you can find is something called a man eater boar. This big fella might look similar to the big boars you already fight in the base game, but these boars in the chalice have new moves to kick you so they aren't so easily backstabbed. 
From Software has also experimented with two versions of the Bloodletting Beast. That's where the headless variation comes from. Heck, if From Software even went so far as to add altered versions of bosses to Sekiro a year after that game's original release, I have hope. If not for Bloodborne, then for a future title. But now, let's move on to the final anchor of Bloodborne, and this one's big. Bloodborne is pretending to be an RPG. Again, to clarify, my following criticisms of Bloodborne's RPG mechanics are not giving a pass to the other Soulsborne games. They are all each imbalanced in their own deeply rooted way. It just so happens that Bloodborne's deeply rooted problems stem from the fact that it grandfathered in the RPG mechanics from the Souls games when it should have divorced itself from them entirely. From what we can tell from cut content and from updates after its release, Bloodborne would end up as an action RPG where the RPG side of things was both downright bare bones while also being exceedingly unintuitive. The core experience of defeating bosses and gradually leveling up your character was still there. Like, it mimics the typical experience you would get from a Souls game, sure, but the amount of stats to pick from and choose was the lowest it had ever been. The builds that you can make, the diversity that's there, doesn't come from the stats, but rather from the trick weapons, the actual moves that you use. And the stats that were there were oddly weighted in their effectiveness. Take Endurance, for example. You needed to level up Endurance to 25 before you could have the stamina necessary to swing the saw cleaver one extra time. What's more, stamina soft caps at 40 Endurance, meaning if you went higher than 40, you would only get one stamina for every five or seven levels of Endurance until 99. So what's the point then? Poison resistance? Moving on, there's Arcane. Whereas all the other offensive stats soft capped themselves at 50, Hunter Tools still scaled with Arcane all the way to 99. Now that seems fun. Makes you want to try a 99 Arcane build, right? Except everything a 99 Arcane build could do, a BL4, that's blood level 4, challenge runner could do with a beast blood pellet and a saw cleaver. And they could do all the damage of a 99 Arcane build, but much much faster. Now, you might have thought that Arcane and Blood Tinge were the caster stats of this game. They weren't even that. Hunter Tools and Guns are not a comparable successor to casting in the Souls games, even if the functionality eh, was somewhat similar. Firstly, you could argue that Quicksilver Bullets might it be an FP bar in disguise, but at least in the Souls games, there was always a stat you could level up if you wanted to cast more. In Bloodborne, there was no stat for that. You needed a Carol rune instead, but even equipping a rune to raise your bullet count was not recommended. Folks who tended to use tools or guns a lot would often use emergency blood bullets in order to replenish their stock, which on the good side was a sound balance to the question of using prolonged range combat. But one thing that was not sound was the fact that pistols could be shot in quick succession and could reliably stun enemies. So here you have Arcane with Hunter Tools on one side and Blood Tinge with Spamming Guns on the other. Two different extremes. One vastly underdeveloped and weak, and the other vastly obnoxious and overwhelming. Also, if you used Bone Marrow Ash on your guns and sprayers, these problems only further amplified themselves. Now we need to talk about when the stats told you nothing, like with Skill and Beasthood. Even if you were to select these two stats to try and get more information on what they do, they keep valuable information from you. If you leveled up skill, for instance, your visceral attacks would be greatly increased. And I mean greatly increased. Visceral attacks were normally affected by your blood level and how much AR your weapon is packing, but skill upped the visceral damage by all metrics to an insane degree. There's a whole discussion to be had about redesigning how much damage Viscerals ought to do, but the issue of my current topic at the moment is the fact that the game did not, and to this day does not, tell you that skill affects Viscerals at all. Meanwhile, Beasthood uses itself in its own description to describe itself. The higher this attribute, the closer you are to Beasthood when temporarily transformed. Huh? You still haven't told me what Beasthood is about, game. And 
for all of your sakes, I'm going to tell you right now. It turns out that Beasthood is that gauge that appears whenever you eat a Beast Blood pellet or equip the Beast Claws. To put it simply, this gauge is like a glass cannon mechanic. If you gradually fill up the gauge, mainly by attacking something, you will do more damage when you hit enemies, but you will suffer more damage if hit. The bigger your beast hood number, the bigger the gauge will be, and the bigger the gauge is, the more of a glass cannon you can become, on paper anyway. Beast hood is practically busted in that it makes you more of a cannon than glass, but that's another plate of cookies for another glass of milk. The only stat here doing its job properly was Vitality, but no one levels that. Now, let's talk about another RPG feature. Specifically, we're going to be talking about damage types, the elemental ones, Blood, Arcane, Fire, and Bolt. Despite having different varieties of offense and defense, all that these different damage types really amount to in the grand scheme of Bloodborne is whether or not you want your weapons to be multicolored while you're hitting something. Do you want to do red damage or blue damage? Because despite being an RPG, the elemental types of Blood, Arcane, and Bolt have little to no special interactions or gameplay complements that fire and oil do. But even when it comes to fire, players only have access to oil pots as a means of increasing their fire damage, a consumable that is incredibly difficult to land and aim, by the way. You can't set somebody on fire in Bloodborne, something that plenty of other RPGs do just fine. Heck, even Sekiro has it so you could set people on fire, which both stun said enemy and continue to burn them shortly afterward. Bolt being the lightning of the Bloodborne universe has no special interaction with water. You can't shock someone for extra stun or deal extra damage because they're soaked or in a puddle. Blood, quite literally, is just red paint. The only interaction that it gets is against dogs. Basically, shoot dogs or hit them with a blood tinge weapon and they fall over. The animal cruelty stat. And then there's Arcane. Arcane. Remember how I said that Arcane as a damage stat isn't the same as the casting stats of the Souls games? Well, Arcane as a damage type is basically magic damage from the Souls games, but for eldritch beings. The thing is, a lot of enemies and bosses in Bloodborne tend to have higher resistances to the Arcane type. Why? Because casters had it coming, probably. So with the bare-bone stats and superficial damage types in mind, all of this points to the idea that Bloodborne should have been an action game rather than an action RPG. And I'm going to quick fire some other issues before we get to the crux of this argument. Here's a pretty big issue. You can't respec your character in Bloodborne. Something from software would include in all of their games afterward. Heck, even Dark Souls 2 got the respec feature, and it came out before Bloodborne. Being able to respec or to change the stats of your build is self-explanatory. That's something that we should be able to do. More recent Souls games have even allowed you to be able to change how you look without spending any in-game currency or finite item. Bloodborne needs to have something like this for sure. Another issue, the Bloodstone upgrade materials are entirely too restrictive for a game with as small of a weapon roster as the ones we ended up having in Bloodborne. Say you got a bunch of cool weapons, which you ought to at the end of Bloodborne, but you don't have any Bloodstone chunks or Blood Rocks to upgrade those new weapons. You now have to either farm or rerun a new playthrough in order to upgrade them to see their full worth. Experimentation feels discouraged and too much of a hassle. And the trick weapons, like we have said, are some of the best parts of this game. Why is the RPG stopping us from enjoying the best part of the game? And then there's blood gems. I will keep the discourse on these gems brief because there is way too much potential jargon that might muddy up the message. In short, all we need to know for our purposes is that the power blood gems can offer a player often do more to break the game's combat than they do to complement it. One simple example would be to look at the limb break system. Limb break. In Bloodborne, there is an experimental mechanic that predates the posture of Sekiro and the stance breaks of Elden Ring. 
In Bloodborne, you could individually break limbs of larger bosses, beasts, kin, you name it. Breaking limbs was rather simple. If you focus all of your attacks on, say, an arm, a leg, or the head of your enemy, you might get to break that limb. And once you do, this causes a small burst of damage, and the host is stunned in a specific way. After their limbs are broken, the boss will respond differently based on which limb you've broken. They might act more frantic. They might try to retreat to heal themselves. It's pretty neat once you pay attention to the interactions at play. But the oversight comes when the limb break system is affected purely based on how much health damage your weapon does. This is not neat. Because if your weapon has a high amount of attack power, or AR, you can break limbs like it was trivial, making mincemeat of several boss fights. This differs with how Elden Ring calculate their health and posture damage, which are typically separate from one another. For example, you could use two different great hammers when fighting Margit, one highly upgraded and one unupgraded. Both would still break his posture using the same attacks, the only difference being the total overall damage you do to him. Meanwhile, in Bloodborne, you could walk into Amelia's boss fight with your all gemmed up saw cleaver, and all you had to do was just look in her direction and her bones would start cracking. Bloodborne's combat and its bosses, the game's biggest strengths become invalidated all because your weapon has a big number, even more so than it would have been in all the other Souls games where you could do the same thing. Now in this case, it's a double whammy. The limb break system is running perpendicular to how overpowered blood gems could become. If blood gems couldn't be changed or completely overhauled, then I'd like the limb break system to receive a more modern revision. Have the limbs only affected by highly committal moves like fully charged attacks as a start, or separate poise damage from AR, if possible. Two final notes about blood gems. There are both too many types of blood gems out there, while also not being arranged to appear properly in the game in a natural, seamless way. For new players trying to understand blood gems, you are scarcely given good ones, both as a fixed drop in the game world and as random drops from enemies. More often than not, a new player is gonna have to play the game as they would have with Dark Souls, especially if they played that for the first time. They'll only focus on upgrades and leveling up their stats. And then when it comes time to face some of the in-game bosses or DLC bosses for that matter, they'll find that their weapons hit like wet noodles until they've looked up an online guide or they got their overleveled friend to kill the boss for them. But let's say that you are in the know. For nearly every kind of build in the game, the best type of blood gem to put on your weapon will typically be a tempering. Tempering blood gems directly increase your damage with no extra fuss. Sharp gems? Never a use for them. Pulsing gems? Might be worth it to put on your gun, but they're not mandatory. Poor man gems? Unless you're a no-hit prodigy, get temperings. And all of this is considering that you aren't going to go through the chalices to get the best of the best abyssals. A special mention if you're an arcane build, all I can say to y'all is good luck. You're gonna need it. The base game itself only drops three elemental gems for an arcane build, and they're each a different damage type, so you can't even combine them into one weapon for big damage. You can't match the damage of a physical build as an arcane. I'm sorry. Are we feeling tired yet? I'm sorry for keeping y'all here so long. Uh, we haven't even talked about poor AI pathing, how unrefined some bosses' hitboxes are. There's also a huge imbalance in the trick weapon roster, ranging from weapons that are too overpowered to weapons that are too underpowered. And perhaps the most grueling of it all, something we barely scratched, the chalice dungeon grinding, from the ritual materials to the blood gems that you have to farm. I'll spare y'all the details. To wrap this topic up, the RPG mechanics of Bloodborne frequently run aground with the action of Bloodborne. It's either an inconvenience at best, or it actively hinders the gameplay at worst. If you had to ask me how we could possibly change or overhaul the system of blood gems and the stat system, I would say simply look at how Sekiro does it. 
Sekiro is an action game through and through, with none of the complications that an RPG brought to the other Souls games. In Sekiro, there were only four things you had to worry about upgrading. Your health, your attack power, your prosthetic arm, and your combat skill trees. Each and every aspect of those upgrades were way more seamless to understand by comparison to Bloodborne. Save for the upgrade materials for the endgame shinobi tools, Otherwise, you got health from finding prayer beads, which you got from either exploring or beating side bosses. Your attack power, meanwhile, got leveled up whenever you defeated a narrative important boss. So not only were you naturally scaling along with the challenge of the game, you could focus on more important things, like the plot, or like mastering the combat. Because sure, in Sekiro, you could just beat a boss by pressing L1 and R1, but have you considered that you could be cooler than that? How about blowing up bosses with an explosive flamethrower, or hitting them in the eyes with pocket sand? You don't have to farm for more attack power in Sekiro. The limit of the gameplay only depended on your creativity. And in Bloodborne, if you gamed the upgrades a little too hard, there would be no need for creativity. Now, I've implanted the idea, so I might as well just say it. Bloodborne would have been the masterpiece that most folks believe it to be if it was more like Sekiro and less like Dark Souls. If it were somehow possible for a studio or developer or publisher or whoever to take the best parts of Bloodborne and either smooth out the rough edges or replace them entirely, then and only then will we have a Bloodborne worth porting to PC, in my humble opinion. And if you had to make me choose between a remaster or a remake for Bloodborne, I would without a doubt choose the Scholar of the First Sin Edition. <laughs> that sounds like a joke, but it's not. Now listen, Dark Souls 2, in its entirety, is its own Pandora's box that I'm choosing not to open today. What I want to make note of is what Scholar of the First Sin did for that game. It didn't have the marketing subtitles like remaster or remake attached to it, which by their very nature, remasters and remakes don't have strict rules on what they should be. But what Scholar did do was act as a sound reintroduction to Dark Souls 2 for many different players. It was effectively a next-gen version of Dark Souls 2 while also being an effectively profound update for the game. Scholar made upgrades to visual fidelity and performance. There's your 60 FPS, y'all. Scholar also moved and replaced certain enemy and item placements. If Bloodborne's Blood Gems got a replacement, or if the Bloodborne New Game Plus cycle got a complete overhaul similar to what Scholar gave to Dark Souls 2, those would be refreshing. And finally, Scholar also improved online matchmaking and increased the multiplayer limits. Now, Soul Memory still exists in Scholar, but hey, at least Scholar gave Dark Souls 2 some well-needed love. So again, if you ask me of all the things that Bloodborne would need, I believe it would need this kind of treatment the most. And you know who made Scholar the First Sin? From Software. Perhaps the only ones who might do a better Bloodborne right could very well be the original developer themselves. Now, this isn't a guarantee. The original studio making a remake or a remaster or a 1.5 HD remix can still make errors along the way, but would y'all feel more comfortable, more self-assured if it was from software at the wheel of Bloodborne again, rather than another developer? I don't know. Maybe this is just a shot in the dark. From Software seems pretty occupied at the moment. They do have Elden Ring DLC to finish up, uh, Armored Core 6 to release, and... Listen, the reason why I've been stressing so much about Bloodborne's core issues is because, well, it's actually because of a lot of reasons, but partly because I know what I'm talking about is a fruitless endeavor. I'm trying to preserve the past and selfishly try to recapture what made Bloodborne so special to me the first time I played it. And I'm hoping other people could see Bloodborne in the same way I did back then. Some of the issues I've spent way too long today talking about could very well be non-issues for someone playing through the game for the first time. I didn't bat an eye when I picked up the game in 2015. It was my first Soulsborne game. I didn't know what to be aware of. I didn't know what to look out for. I was just completely enraptured by the look and feel of the game. And it looked and felt 
like nothing I've ever played up to that point. And yet, the more I played, the more I fell in love with the game. And the more I loved it, the more I wanted to delve in. And the more I delved in, the more metaphorical insight I gained along the way. And then the problem amygdalas kept appearing in each and every corner of the game. And as much as folks love to remember how great Bloodborne was, if y'all care to look under the hood, you would find them too. And I also realized that all of these issues could be stepped right over if From Software themselves were to simply make an entirely new game. Like, imagine if From Software made the spiritual successor to Bloodborne, be it a sequel or a straight up new IP that follows the footsteps of Bloodborne's gameplay. Now that would be spectacular, wouldn't it? And we would all instantly want that new thing. Solve all the problems, make something new. Win-win situation. But that still leaves Bloodborne behind. Remember those two words from earlier? Support and preservation. Support if Sony were to support this game again and try to sell it to you. They had better do it right the first time or find someone who will. Preservation. There was this nerd on Twitter, she has a funny looking hat, who said something to the effect of, a game's flaws are just as worth preserving as its perfections. And I'm torn. Because if Bloodborne were re-released on PC and PS5, and they charged $70 for it, they had better be more perfections than flaws for that asking price. Bloodborne deserves way more love than to simply become a nostalgia cash grab. And yet, at the same time, Bloodborne's past deserves to be remembered. All of the past, all of the good, all of the bad. It would show how far from software has come, and it would show to us how far we, the players, have come. There are a lot of old techniques in Bloodborne that could be lost to time if we're so busy trying to move past them like with the chalice dungeons, or with the limb breaking, or with the funny gesture mashups. Perhaps there's another double-edged lesson to be learned from all this. Here's a non-rhetorical question for you. You can answer it down below. How much is Bloodborne worth to you? How much would you give to a company or a team or to the idea that you might get a game that generates happy memories? It is nice to look back at the seeds of the past, to recall the excitement and the wonder you felt, but that was then. And today, we have to take what's rotten with what's ripe. Bloodborne is a beautiful mess of a video game, and it should be remembered as such. One thing I don't want to admit, we're closer to the 2030s than we are to Bloodborne's original release date. Where did the time go? Do me a favor, y'all. Besides liking and subscribing, tell the people you care about that you care about them. Because tomorrow's not guaranteed, and yesterday was a year ago.